Good evening, everybody. My name's Ant, and I am the project manager for the Culture Co-op, which is the Lancaster District Cultural Education Partnership. And there's over 100 SEPs, what we call them, across the UK, and they're the Arts Council's answer for trying to link art and cultural education within schools to young people. So it's making sure that all young people get access to kind of really high quality art but it also is a place where collaboration can be fostered and people can work together and artists can develop their practice and stuff so it's quite a broad thing in terms of supporting art and culture in all the different kind of regions in the UK so the salons these things have been created as a safe space for people to come and talk about a particular topic or anything that they want to talk about and all we ask is that people are uh, respectful, open and thoughtful to one another, and you can share as much or as little as you want. So tonight's salon is based on collaboration, the topic and the notion of collaboration. So we've got a video chat between uh, two professionals, Sarah Domville and Jude Bird from Curious Minds. Curious Minds are the bridge organisation in the Northwest, so they bridge education and culture and art. Um, so after you've watched it, it's about 11 minutes, and then we'll just have a chat and see if we can come up with some exciting things. I've got some question prompts. No, nope. Excellent. So I'm just going to share... So, um, hello, I'm Sarah Domville. I'm a cultural education manager at Curious Minds. And um, I'm going to be talking to Jude Bird for the next five or ten minutes about collaboration. So, I'd like to introduce Jude to you. Jude is the um, director of programmes at Curious Minds, and collaboration has been a key part of Jude's work, both as a creative practitioner and also in her role at Curious Minds. And she's also written about this subject. So Jude, my first question to you is, um, what is collaboration? How would you define it? Well, that's a small question, Sarah. <laughs> I'm actually going to read you what I wrote because I think it's useful, it's pithy and succinct. So I'm defining collaboration as a process um, defined by the interaction of knowledge and mutual learning between two or more people who are working together on an intellectual or artistic endeavor towards a common goal, which is typically creative in nature. So kind of product orientated. Um, and the collaborative methods are processes, behaviors and conversations that relate to collaboration between those individuals. These methods are specifically aimed to increase the success of the teams they engage with in problem solving. So really looking at the kind of mutual approach to that. And I think I want to differentiate here between cooperation, which is something, you know, on a day to day basis, because I see cooperation as based on commonality, whereas I see that collaboration is often based on paradoxes. So it has a level of complexity in there. Mm -hmm. um, so how are these individuals coming together to create something new and solve those problems? And why I think it's complex is that it often requires those individuals um, to be, it's quite Zen, to be in the moment, to bring what they bring, but be prepared to put quite a lot of it down. Yeah, and I'm interested in, in your article that you write about um, transformation. And, mm -hmm. um, and I just wondered, and that actually in order for it to be collaboration, some kind of transformation needs to happen. Yeah, I think that there's something about the notion of healthy disruption. So you have a practice, another artist has a practice, you've developed a modus operandi and a way of doing something. But in coming together, you're almost offering yourself to the process of disruption. So how are you going to think differently 
operate differently. And there's a whole research methodology called dilemma analysis. And what I've found in the work I've done is that often where the greater dilemma exists, often the collaboration is richer. Mm. That's, that's really interesting because that suggests to me that um, collaboration pushes us outside of our comfort zones as well. It could, pushes us into new areas and, and areas uh, we're not perhaps so au fait. Yeah, I, I think there is that thing of trusting that process. So knowing what you come with but it's only when you stand outside that. So I don't think there are things like, um, you know, expected outcomes, except maybe there's a product. I think that often the learning or the enrichment or the product almost occurs as a byproduct of that kind of, um, yeah, it's almost a transmutation as well as a, a transformation. You know, long on alchemy. So, Jude, in your work at uh, Curious Minds, you often bring schools and cultural organisations together. What would you say the challenges are to that kind of cross-sector collaboration? I think schools and teachers are trained in a particular way, so they are often looking for quite specific outcomes. And that ability to really suspend belief and trust in a another who has come from a different background um, is, is quite a challenge. I think often artists come in and perhaps if they were in the world of the teachers, they would be senior leaders or head teachers. But it's hard for the schools to recognize that when somebody comes in, you know, with an earring in relaxed clothing, looking quite different. So I think that sort of codifying is, is quite interesting. And that ability to hand over power and trust that somebody else will work with your pupils and will work with you mm. and produce something different um, is a huge process of trust because I think both are working um, with different success measures and the way that it has to work is there has to be real dialogue and real understanding and a desire on the part of both of those partners to really want to get under the skin of this and create something which is for the benefit of the children and young people they work with. And what often happens in this situation is that the children that have previously shone um, are not always the ones that shine in a different process. So the light is often shone in a different way and can really bring the non-usual suspects into that situation. So I think different inputs create different outcomes. Yeah, and it almost goes back to what you were saying earlier about collaboration almost being a process of disruption, because what you're doing there in, in some ways is disrupting the norm. Um, exactly. In terms of the expectation ar around the... Um, the young people and also um i'm wondering whether there's some kind of element within that of kind of um of improvisation that look i think the whole thing is improvisation i think life is improvisation but that's where that whole relational thing really kicks in um you know, you have to have your tools, then you have to be prepared to amalgamate those, tease things out. Um, there's a lovely exercise, you probably know it, Sarah, um, and it's that very simple thing of who's leading and who's following, and it's a hand exercise. And so you can do it in a very specific way and say change, but then there's a very subtle version of that where you don't quite know who's leading and who's following. And I think that's a really wonderful metaphor for collaboration. 
Yeah, so everyone is in a way is a kind of a co-learner and a co-facilitator. The, yeah. the line between the learner and the leader, which is normally very defined in a in a, in, a, in a school, um, is is different. Well, it it merges, it shifts, it changes, and I think it's you know it'll lead us beautifully onto the next thing. But I think it's about that ability to trust the uncertainty and um and believe in the process yeah so my final question jude this is um very kind of fitting given the the current situation is how do you think that the current situation with covid perhaps opens up new opportunities for collaboration i think that sort of leading on from the last question we are all in a time of complete and utter uncertainty and the sort of notion of the real value of working alliances. None of us can sort this out on our own. And I think that some of the best things that will come out of this time are non-usual alliances that will be forged. And, you know, in times, you know, perish the thought of war and famine and plague and pestilence. Um, everything shifts. Mm. And in so doing, the old ways fall away and um, a kind of sea change takes place out of necessity. Mm. And we are absolutely in that space. And we know that artists are great innovators yeah. and great risk takers and to bring a kind of fresh perspective and to work with their communities of interest their communities of practice and likewise educators who've had to find completely new ways of doing things sort of immediately transforming everything onto a digital platform or to work in blended learning and so I think that the will will be there to collaborate as never before. So I think it is the propitiousness of the time. It will be the zeitgeist of 2020, 2021. Well, I hope you're right. <laughs> I do too. Thanks, Jude. There you go. So I, I have two questions to kick us off. The first question is, what sector do you consider yourselves a part of? Because obviously there, there was quite a few sectors talked about the education sector, the community sector, the artistic cultural sector. So the first question is, what, what, what sector do you consider yourself being part of? And the second question is, um, what's your one takeaway from that video? Okay. Who would like to go first? Jane, do you want to go first? Because you've just put your thumbs up. I know, that was a bad idea, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's a difficult one for me. So I would say I work across all three sections. Um, so I'm a teacher by training, uh, but I also direct and perform and, and I'm passionate about community work. So... Uh, yeah, definitely kind of in that intersection, if it was a Venn diagram, you know, there'd be the three little circles and I'd be right in the middle of it. Mm. Phil, what about diagram. you? You see what I mean? There you go. Shh, smashed it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll find it. I'll, I'll draw it now. <laughs> uh, I think I'd be more, I guess, artistic. Um, because I create music and like I've done video work and things in the past. And the thing I took from the video was the uh, discussion over disruption, how the collaboration is disruption, um, and how it challenges your own ways of working. What about you, Jane, in terms of the what, what are your takeaways from that, that discussion? Um, I think it's, it's interesting that often 
organisations, particularly creative organisations, set up this kind of um, kind of two sides, you know, education and arts. And I think, and that's I think that's probably a bit reductive for both sides actually. Um, and I, you know, I think that's a, a, a bless that I've never met the lady, but I think the, this idea that you know teachers are kind of um, unbalanced by somebody who comes in with an earring. I mean, a lot of teachers are quite, <laughs> quite kind of cool these days. They're okay, you know. And and I think a lot of them are creatives and makers in their own right. And actually, the problem is not that they don't want to engage with those processes, but but time. Mm. You know, time is probably at the heart of the the issue. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I. Um... I'm a, I'm a trained teacher, so I did my PGC cert ed, um, and I worked at a college for a while. And but I've also been um, working for arts organisations, going yeah. into schools and teaching um, creative classes, dance classes, that kind of thing. And and you know, you do find that, yeah, time and there tends to be within a school there tends to be kind of one, two, three teachers that are really passionate about passionate about creative practice, and they'll go full force into it but they're the only ones kind of holding up that whole thing in the school because sometimes it's not a kind of creativity tends to kind of fall quite low on the ladder in some schools because you, you know, you're always looking at English, maths and science, aren't you really? Mm. And just getting the grades through. And and um, I think it will, it'll, it's going to be really interesting, isn't it? How, what that kind of response is when we go back after COVID, like do people go, actually the things that kept people that kept the kids going that helped them deal with their mental health were creative or will they go shit they they missed a year mm. we drop all of that and we and we have to push on with the maths and english and i think that kind of response is what is what will be interesting and what will maybe lay the groundwork for how education and culture kind of works together for the next five years yeah yeah and I think um, there's a lot of talk of recovery curriculum. Mm, yeah, Let you, yeah, summer school. Mm. Is, is are there talks that there's only going to be like a three week summer? <laughs> yeah, I mean they're talking about just not having it at all. It's crazy. Like this has been a holiday, you know, for them. Bless them, poor little thing. But I know that in 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 some countries, is it Sweden where children don't start school until they're seven? Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, they don't start formal education until the seven, but they still do. Yeah. Mm. Um, David, so kind of talk a little bit about your sector and sectors, sector mm. sectors, and mm -hmm. also kind of your key takeaways from that discussion. Yeah. Okay. So, um, from an organisational standpoint, I work in health and care uh, these days, um, um, but professionally my sector uh, in that discussion would be again would be a creator artist um um because most of my work is primarily in communications and marketing um did identify with quite a few different of the, of the topics within that, that that discussion one of the things i found that is um um especially sort of uh, um uh coming up again and again as Every sector, every organisation in the area, in, in you know, globally at this point, is looking for new ways to communicate and get their message across. Uh, is is disruption? Um, it keeps coming up again, again, again. But interestingly, um, what I found, uh, especially in the last six months or so, is that we're having to do more and more disruption to our own teams internally um, to shake things up. Um, Working in a, in, a, in a sector which is an organisation which is incredibly well regulated, extremely professional, you know, extremely high standards to maintain, uh, and yet in order to do that, in order to make sure we can do our jobs and make sure the organisation can meet and keep meeting its standards and keep communicating effectively and making sure we can keep funding coming in for, for, uh, as well it is we're having to completely shake up the way in which we go about normal processes and that has been an element we had to sort of uh, especially when working with, with departments that tend to just do their own thing 
having to go in there and it's like go in there and shake them up <laughs> and some of them like that because it, it but and some of them don't but it always brings up uh, about new ideas and things end up being better in the long run but uh, I think with I think sometimes when the departments here the comms team are coming for a word they think oh god no not again <laughs> yeah. definitely definitely identify with that as um as sort of like the um of the key points in uh, in, in in collaboration definitely so my my next question that's come out of this is obviously part of the discussion there with with sarah and um jude was a lot around collaboration is a risk so there's a lot of risk to collaborating particularly if you if you're wanting to be authentic and trust and give yourself to the the moment and to the experience and the process in this current climate can we afford to take risks is the because you, you know we talk about recovery curriculum within education within the the charity sector we talk about you know try to save jobs and you know is 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 now the time to take risks or is now the time to re, yeah recover or is is collaboration the key to recovery because obviously Jude seemed to think that 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 was the the more so now than ever as we move into kind of the recovery period post COVID that more and more collaboration is going to happen do you guys agree with that do you have, does everybody agree with that yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think um uh, in whatever sector that you work in um in whatever capacity you work in i think um one of the things that especially the people who are who have uh like to, like educators because they've worked through throughout all of this you know they've been in the in the thick of it as well as you know um the care sector health sector all those different those people who are seen as frontline working they will probably say that yeah now is the time to take risks because we can't do things the same as we did before things it, it's we need to take what's worked during this period and carry on with it build on it because there's some some now is the chance to do new things now is the chance to correct the problems and the issues that people have been having in all different areas now is the time to, to, to make those changes while we have the option to change if things go back to normal things like set like concrete and it's back to normal now we've lost this opportunity to actually shake things up and do things in a new way does everybody else agree with that i, I think it's it's difficult, isn't it? Because you you talk about uh, collaboration and risk taking, and there are creative risks, but there are also physical risks. So I think people, you know, I think the irony is that digitally we're more connected, but physically in real life we're less connected, and and you kind of. I think I can envisage actually, so as an artist who goes into schools, nobody wants you in schools at the moment. Do, 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 and, and in a sense, I think there are plenty of artists who also don't want to be in schools. So delivering work like this is one thing, but, um, you know, I, I, we're, I've got one of the bubble up commissions from Curious Minds and trying to deliver that, you know, we keep pushing it back because actually the value of that commission is to deliver it in person. But the practicality of delivering that is, is really, currently you can't, you can't do it in person. Mm -hmm. So I think the risk taking is, is interesting because risk operates on a number of different levels. You know, there's this kind of creative risk, there's personal risk, but there's, then there's that kind of global risk as well. And so I think that's going to be an interesting one for us to navigate. I know collaboration in a digital world, is that even possible? <laughs> yeah. I, I've got, I'm doing a project next week uh, that should have been in real life and they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't postpone it. So we've, we've been forced to do it digitally. And actually what is interesting is it, talking about disruption, it has made, uh, 
the the two artists that are working together, it has made us think about how we deliver. We've come up with some way of doing it, and part of that is is this kind of blended approach. You know, some of it is going to be tangible and physical, so there can be packs going out that people can we can unbox together. But then the delivery is going to have to be digital, and I, it'll be interesting at the end of it to see how valuable that is or not. Because mm. when you're collaborating in real life, IRL, <laughs> you um, you get you particularly when I'm team teaching and and doing things in a space, you, you get your cues by people's yeah. body language and the physicality yeah. and the energy in the room and the environment, and and when I'm collaborating and creating with other artists it's 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 tangible it's almost tangible those energies in in the environment and when you shift into online you don't have that you don't have those cues that you would but normally have the in amount, a space the, the amount as a as a creative that you have to prep so what i noticed like for this week is i would normally have a structure but i wouldn't pin it down too hard because i'd want to respond to what individual young people brought to that project if you send them stuff that they need to do, if it's, and then they've got to, you know, you have to re kind of have stuff that you can react to online. That's much more prescriptive uh, and doesn't allow maybe for the kind of space that you want to, to develop creatively. That's kind of where I'm struggling. Uh, lads, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I think when you're in a place of um, like, oh, heck, what do we do? And those kind of inspirations and the collabs will come naturally sometimes, I've found. But if you're in a place of, um, oh, well, we can't do this, well, what can we do? And gets that group think going in before you know it, you're revolutionising, mm. if that's mm. a word. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's um, because obviously the um, doing things from a digital um, remote you know, in a digital remote way, um, it's forcing people to think outside the box, isn't it? It's forcing people to think about new ways to make the most of the situations. Uh, really, almost like um, refine things or just try and squeeze the most out, out of the, the situation you can. And I suppose that's, that, that's a nice attitude to try and take over to when things uh, return to the point where we can uh, openly collaborate in shared spaces, uh, in schools, in, in, in you know, naturally um, uh, social environments and things. So that sort of extra concentration required to create, develop things remotely could maybe, um, change enhance um enrich um projects um uh, and, and collaborations once you can meet up again so again it's maybe a chance of um yeah just making learning what's um learning from what we've all experienced and taking taking the bits that are worth keeping over back to normality i think one of the takeaways for me in the discussion is like Phil said, is that notion of disruption because I really love collaborating with other artists because I feel that, you know, I have a certain skill set and if I'm collaborating with other people from different fields and forms, then the product that we create is going to be far better than what I could do by myself. But because I'm always very eager to please and very eager for everybody to be happy and content and um, it be nice and balanced, that that I try and shy away from disruption and, and challenge in, in, in creative collaborative um, processes and situations. So I think that's really interesting for me to move into some of the next things that I do is that disruption and um, kind of when people um, clash, clashes are good because it means that there's the passion behind it and that there's the care. And one of my next questions to you guys if, if you're happy to receive another question is how hard is it to take the ego out of the equation 
because I think as artists sometimes we we have to fight for ourselves because not many people fight for us because the arts are in, in a lot of areas are considered very important but to a lot of us we are very important so we're always kind of fighting fighting our corner and, and getting our voice out there so yeah that's that question how hard is it to take the ego out of the equation does anybody have any kind of examples of where they've worked with someone where they've been a massive ego and how have you managed that or or have you been a massive ego and that's kind of changed the dynamic of the collaborative process Uh, but I can go on that one. Um, when I, I collaborated with somebody in Colorado, so it was all done digitally um, on this track, and I'd done the vocals, sent them across, and then it ended up being this really cool song. Um, but then we were talking to a guy from Lithuania who was going to create the music video for it. And how can I put this? The music video came out a lot more X-rated than we expected. Um, and I thought it was way too much. And I argued my point that I think it's too much. I didn't want to put my name to it if that was going to be on the video. Um, and then it ended up being this huge argument over, that's my vision, that's my artist, artistry. But sometimes you've got to take the criticism and not take it personally. And I think that's the key that when you take it personally, it's not a criticism of you, it's a criticism of your work. It's a separate thing. So I think you've got to be mindful of that and also be willing to compromise is a huge thing. Um, and sometimes you do have to back down, um, to be fair. Unless it's something you feel strongly about, like I did with that, I just thought it was way too much. and. Thankfully, the guy from Colorado agreed and we had it all reworked and toned down. So, yeah, it was hard, difficult. I agree with you in that statement where you said taking yourself out of the art because we're artists and we're so passionate about what we do and we are our art. And I've known I've known people that, that work for organisations that have built it up from nothing and they are their organisation and when they leave their organisation they're nothing they feel empty so it, it's it's healthy to separate yourself from your art which will then help you kind of not be unhappy when someone disagrees with you but it also lets you view your work um, subjectively like I look back at some of my past work and I think oh my god what the hell's I thinking oh. mm. But I think that's how you grow up and that's how you that's how you'll grow up. Otherwise you become I'm never wrong. Da, 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 da. You end up ego driven that way. Yeah. What about you, Jane? I kind of think that's where collaboration helps actually, because if you if you are driven to create if if you're driven by producing something really good so if the product is the end goal then actually it it automatically reduces ego in it because what you're after is you know either a fantastic piece of music or a great project or a really good experience for people so once and and if you're working with somebody else that allows you to keep the focus on that um and and that that removes your ego. And I think if you're if you're always thinking about the product and the audience and that experience, uh, yeah, that's that's maybe the way I kind of try and make sure it's less of a you know my baby. Does anybody want to suggest a question based on the discussion or anything that we've talked about? Does anybody have a question for anybody? I've got a question. Like, what would you say is the difference between cooperation and co collaboration? We heard them touching it slightly in the video, but mm. what would you say is the difference? Mm. And is one is one passive and one active? 
like is cooperation potentially passive because you're just going with the flow is cooperation well co- i think cooperation is cooperation is kind of is is a uh, perhaps a slightly easier concept because it's you've got a common goal you just have to not step on each other's toes to actually achieve said goal you know you can cooperate and work very independently whereas collaboration you know you've got a more abstract grander goal maybe that you have to agree on that is um can't be achieved without both of your efforts i'd say um otherwise it, 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 yeah i think it's it's you you could be quite passive in a cooperative situation can you you could uh, just not just not get in someone's way um work together in a very sort of like um hands off kind of way where if you're going to be collaborating then then you know even the end goal could be could be changing in um you know from as as you work but there is has there has to be sort of that um um you know disruptive interaction between your between two or more parties definitely if and even then it's going to be um it might not be entirely pleasant it's not always you know it's not always 100 percent um uh, enjoyable sometimes sometimes there's you know like, like we've, i've touched on the whole ego situation it can mirror its head but yeah i think you think you touched on it rightly there one can be passive the other one can't be if it's going to be true truly collaborative it needs to be a proper blending i suppose i mean that's just me but Mm. yeah cooperation sounds like you're kind of doing your bit but the goal was already there doesn't it collaboration feels like a much more active participation where you work together to to produce something that maybe you weren't even sure what it was when you started out oh that's a good point yeah it could be like you want to achieve a goal but you're not entirely sure what the product or any or performance or anything would be at the end that's really interesting actually hey there's no like set physical product at the end that's that's a nice way of looking at it i think that that demands a lot more of you as a creative sort of person as well doesn't it so you've got to Mm. kind of bring yourself to the act of creating with somebody else Mm. you have to put more of yourself out there to get more of it back as well and you have to be as we touched on that whole idea you're going to have to if you really want to collaborate then you really have to drop the ego yeah or uh, to... bring it or bring it to the fight because I, th- I don't think you necessarily have to mm. drop it but you've got to fight your corner until you're convinced that something else is better or or something mm. new is better yeah i like, I like that I be, like be, that. be willing to be willing to acknowledge the fact that your ego might have to take it take a bruising or, you know, ruling to, you know, stand on that hill with your flag and say, hey, I ain't moving, but either way, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna, you're gonna have to acknowledge it. That's cool. I like that. Yeah. So I've just, I've just found the dictionary definitions of both things. So cooperation is the action or process of working together to the same end. And the collaboration definition is the action of working with someone to produce something. Uh, that's about what we came up with, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Not easy. <laughs> and the the verses, so collaboration is a coordinated, synchronous activity that is the result of a continued attempt to construct and maintain a shared concept of a problem. And cooperation yeah. is accomplished by the division of labour among participants as an activity where each person is responsible for solving a portion of the problem. So... Yeah, cooperation the and division is quite interesting, isn't it? That you you take your task, divide it up, collaborate to to mm. achieve it. Mm. But collaboration is coming together. Yeah. So you can. So yeah. from from my take on that as well, you can have cooperation within collaboration. So that yeah. the, there's like yeah. an ebb and flow between collaboration and, and cooperation. I do like that 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 little bit about uh, how it's. Um, how the parties have a shared concept of the problem and i think that that's something that that's something that 
perhaps sometimes get a little bit fuzzy with uh, artists um, or uh, well I definitely say so, especially in the more corporate side of thing which is where, where, where I work most of the time now uh, in, in, in uh, marketing and communications um, getting someone to agree what the problem is <laughs> Mm. Can, it can be actually quite hard to get them to nail it down, um, but that's interesting. That's in there. I like that. And and also mission drift. Mission so drift. maybe cooperation could potentially lead to to mission drift because you've all gone away and you're all doing your own thing. But in those moments where collaboration isn't happening, you're not coming mm. back together to kind of go. Are we still fighting the same problem here? Are we still working on the same topic? <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Very good. Does anybody have any tips for fostering successful collaborations or any tools or exercises? So um, Jude talked about the hand one and there's one that I do all the time with people and with dancers and non-dancers alike and you get um, a stick. So, and one person holds the end of one stick with their finger and the other holds the other, and you've got to move around the space. It, it, I guarantee you it makes everybody feel like a dancer because it's a beautiful task to do. But you, you do start off where one leads and one follows, and then you switch over, and then, then what you do is you, en you enter into an improvisation where there is no leader or no follower, and it ebbs and flows between um, who's leading and who's following, and it's just a really beautiful task for people to do. Um, so I really enjoyed Jude bringing that up in terms of what collaboration looks like physically, visually. Mm. So does anybody else have any kind of tips or tools or exercises? Just as a comment on that, that sounds like that you kind of like introduce both concepts quite nicely in that task. With two people with one stick going from A to B, that would be a, a cooperative measure. But if they're going to be sort of, if they're going to be expressing or trying to create something other than just traveling from point to point it becomes a more collaborative experience so that's i like that i have to Ooh. nick that <laughs> um hmm. i mean there's, there's there's plenty of ways in which um you know uh working between different different teams um in a you know variety of settings with lots of different sort of backgrounds and stuff you have to give people an opportunity to uh regardless of what, what you're working on whether you've got a specific task a specific thing needs creating and you're looking for the best the best messaging for it or you're looking for the best way to to relay some information like uh, like, in the, in, like in the comms stuff that I, that I do you have to find ways to get people on board with the idea of uh, of of um expressing themselves if they, i mean they uh, a lot of my a lot of my job is finding ways to communicate what uh, the different teams in our organization do to the public without necessarily scaring them off because some of it's kind of some of it can be can be uh, kind of daunting to people uh, it's most it's it's work in hospice uh, so it can, you have to try and find ways of making it uh, feel um, accessible, not scary, but be honest about it. And the best people to talk about that are the people who, who work in those teams. But it's not always as simple as sitting down and asking, asking questions and, and getting them to tell, the, tell you what they do. You need to find, to, to, to really produce something which is a, you know, an accurate reflection of what they do that communicates them honestly and effectively. We have to try and find ways of allowing them to express themselves, allowing them to find ways to tell us what they do and what they feel. So we kind of have to experiment with environments, set in settings, how we go about talking to people about trying to get them to open up and give us that information that we need to communicate their story properly. So a lot of what we do is kind of experiments in communication. I suppose you could call it. So there's something there about collaborations, about breathing space and giving time and space for people to find their voices and tell their stories. 
Um, Jen, you were going to... back you were, to oh. what you were saying, sorry. Then that goes back to what you were saying before about what makes good collaboration and it's that making sure everyone's had their voice and there's been, even if you don't necessarily agree with it, um, if you let them speak their part, then they'll, they'll feel more involved within the process. Mm. Uh, Jane, you were going to say something. I, I was just going to say, so there's an exercise. Uh, I'm a, a drama teacher or an actor by training, and there's a lot of sort of spontaneous impro activities where you don't set the goal, so you don't cooperate towards a you know a chosen goal. You collaborate to create a product. So you have to you have to listen to each other and respond so it kind of it's often called gifting and receiving you know if i suggest an idea you you take it on board and and we run with it but equally i listen to you you know and that i think it when it works that is brilliant that's a great example of collaboration and when it fails it's it's spectacular um so yeah uh, that that's my favorite bit there's a lot to take away and there's a lot to unpack. And how much do we give of ourselves in collaborations and how much do we hold back? And personal risk, professional risk, breathing space, time. So like you were saying, Jane, about teachers not having any time, you know, collaboration, true honest, rich collaboration takes time. And there's, you need to build a lot of trust unless you are a person that kind of naturally trusts people anyway, or is, is kind of really open. I think artists do tend to be quite open. Um, I think it's very difficult, isn't it? A, a school is a quite a closed environment. Hmm. And so if you're going into working schools, um, yeah, creating a relationship. Once you've got it, it's great, but actually getting in there and setting those up is, is quite difficult. Um, and understandably, the people in there, you know, is that cooperation thing. They all have a shared goal. They're all working towards it. And sometimes maybe you come in and disrupt that. And that, that, that can be good in a kind of, in an environment where there is yeah time and and facilities and space to do that but if everyone's under pressure then that's quite difficult um, and it's about understanding that i think and being you know um yeah supportive rather than critical yeah yeah mm. and i think understanding that collaboration is a skill in itself mm that is is learnt through experience and through um trial and error i know i know years ago like many many years ago teachers were allowed you know you sometimes you'd be able to take a year off and go and do sabbatical you, you know you get paid to go and do some extra training i mean that concept has gone completely so they're so pushed i think um, that having space to build up relationships with companies or artists is, is very difficult. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>